I jump in the rake like Halo And time I drive into the pesos How do we snap like that? Yeah, voice with the facts like that Yeah, I hop in the coupe, I hop in the booth They know I rap like that Yeah, I got the sauce like a drive-thru The street shake when I ride through I love it all, now I ride through And now these girls playing peek boo Hey, what's up guys? Back again with another video. This episode, I'm going to be starting a new series called Java I.O., which stands for Input and Output. And so we've got pretty far within Java in our learning because I have other series, if you don't know, about maybe over 70 videos of how to learn Java, the main language, and then the library after that, you know, the stuff that you learn after learning the main Java core language. So I've covered a lot of stuff, basically, and uh, I want to move on to some of the more advanced topics. And the next part that I want to go over, the next fundamental thing that you need to know to become an experienced Java developer is Java I.O. or input and output. So yeah, this episode I'll give you a brief overview of what it is. So there's only really one way to get started and it's just to do it. So just, uh, let me get started here. So first, before we start, what can you do with input and output, right? What's the point of even knowing it, right? So you can read and write to files, which means that you can uh, read files, like get input from a... Um, like a text document maybe, like a .txt file, any file that you have on your computer, you can pretty much read from it. Um, some of it's going to be more challenging because, you know, it's different formatting for the file, like a different extension for the file. And then you can also write to files, which means you could uh, control what's inside of the file. You could add just new stuff to the file, or you can totally wipe what's on a file and then replace it with new data. And that's really cool, right? So it's really powerful, as you can imagine. You can control the files on your operating system, and then you can communicate over network sockets, which is... Um, going to be something even more advanced that we're going to talk about a little bit and then you could filter data which is something we're going to talk about we're going to talk about pretty much all of this actually um oh yeah we are so yeah stay hopefully you're excited for that so yeah we can also compress and decompress data for like zip files and stuff like that that'd be pretty cool and then we could write objects to streams which is called serial serialization so we're going to cover much more than that actually but those are some of the few things that you might uh be anticipating uh, but the most popular one is going to be reading and writing to files, which is going to be very soon. That's where we're going to start off with. But yeah, okay. So first we have the topic of streams. And a stream is a ordered sequence of bytes of indeterminate length. But to put it more simply, it's just the mode that the data is put inside of. Okay, so it's like how data travels. It travels within a stream, and then we can access those streams to write the data or retrieve the data. So you have an input stream, which is going to take data from somewhere, like maybe a keyboard, a microphone, a uh, controller here, or a disk drive maybe. Um, these are input devices because as you use them, for example, a keyboard, you're pressing keys and that key data has to be sent somewhere. How does your computer know exactly what you're typing? It's put into a stream and then it's sent um, somewhere, like your CPU or something like that, right? It's sent somewhere and then now with this thing that we're about to learn, we can access the stream that is gonna be containing that input data for your keyboard, right? Same thing with the microphone. This is going to, it's also gonna contain data, and um, it's gonna be a little different than um, the keyboard data because the keyboards are ke keeping track of what keys you press, but this is gonna keep track of the audio, I guess, or whatever format it would be in. But it all boils down to bytes. Every stream boils down to a sequence of bytes, everything, right? Because if you don't know anything about bytes, bytes is really central to computer science. It's zeros and ones, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, uh, infinite combination of zeros and ones. That's how computers talk, basically. That's the language of a computer, because a computer can only be, uh, it can only read zeros and ones deep down in the lowest level, okay? But yeah, I'll explain more. Don't worry about that if you're a little confused. So um, this includes both input and output, stream, output streams, like I said. So output streams would be like a monitor, um, a speaker, because after you do some stuff in the program, maybe that data is then put into a stream and that stream connects to here like a screen, right? And it displays it. So it's reading from the stream and then displaying whatever is inside the stream on the, on the screen or the speaker, right? So output streams are very important, just like input streams are. So just to go over it again, input streams read data from some source while output streams write data, which means it puts the data into a stream that is sent somewhere, okay? So hopefully that makes sense, but streams are basically the essential component of input and output within Java and other languages, okay? So you have stream classes, and um, there's a bunch of subclasses of the two streams. So there's two high-level stream classes that we have. We have input stream, and then we have output stream, okay? These are both abstract classes, right? So that means that you can't actually declare an object of one of these classes, 
but we have a bunch of subclasses under that which are concrete meaning that you can declare an object of one of these and then use them okay so these are basically um, taking a template from one of these it's simple object oriented programming but it's basically taking a template from one of these the top level ones and it's going to take those methods and then override them and uh, customize those methods to whatever uh, you're using it for for example a file input stream is obviously going to be working with files so it's going to work a little bit differently than maybe like a byte array input stream or something like that right and then output stream you have different subclasses under that right so yeah hopefully that makes a little bit of sense but uh, it's basically a really cool hierarchy of streams that come from the top level of input stream and output stream and there's actually more than this more than these classes here because there's tons of different streams that we're going to learn about okay oops getting ahead of myself a little bit so anyway let's go to the next here so now that you understand the hierarchy a little bit um, we can talk about the data right so I told you before that streams transmit data in the form of bytes okay and that's the zeros and ones as you see up here like you usually see in the movies maybe like a hacker you know typing on a terminal it's like really corny but that's actually what uh, computers are you know, like using zeros and ones okay so one byte whenever you hear the word byte that's going to be eight bits and one bit is equal to a zero or a one it can be either one so one bit is can be a zero or a one right so eight bits would be one two three four five six seven eight that would be eight bits which is equal to one byte okay those are basically just different units okay so each bit can be a zero or one like i said and then the number size limit for a bit we can find that by doing two to the power of however many bits there are so for example one byte is equal to eight bits so if we do two to the power of eight we get 256 which means that the number limit or the biggest number that you can fit within one byte is 256 so zero through 256 is the highest number or the number range that you can use for one byte okay so if we were going to do two bytes that would be um, 16 bits right because one byte is eight bits so two bytes would be 16 bits so we would do two to the 16th power I'm not I don't know what that's I don't know what that is off the top of my head but I believe it's like 60,000 or something like that it's a really big number um, but yeah okay so that means you could fit the number zero through 60,000 something like that so it's just very essential to keep in mind how bytes work and how many bits are in a byte because like I said a second ago and like a million other times streams transmit data in bytes okay you can't forget that because that's how we're going to be reading data within bytes all right so one thing you also have to keep in mind is that java likes to use signed values meaning a negative and a positive like an integer so it's really actually one byte in java is actually negative 128 to 127 because it's splitting this value in half to account for the negative values that will fit inside of uh, one byte okay so whenever you want to find the signed value of a byte or a, a bigger number you just split in half basically okay hopefully that makes a little bit of sense because it has to account for the size of the negative and the positive so it has to split in half exactly okay so just keep in mind that um, we're, we're going to talk about this a little later um, Java likes to use uh, mostly most of the time it likes to use the unsigned byte value so 0 through 256 but sometimes it does like to use negative 20, 128 to 127 for example if you make a byte an actual byte variable that's going to be negative 128 to 127 because java likes signed values okay so other data types if we want to make a little, do a little practice with this so we have an integer right an integer is actually four bytes in size okay so that would be four times eight to get the number of bits which is 32 bits so if we do two to the power of 32 we're going to get this massive number here um, that's about one, two, three, uh, four billion, I believe, if I'm not stupid. Yeah, that's about four billion, um, like the range of numbers. So zero through four billion is basically how, or this is the biggest number that you can fit with an integer, basically, what I'm trying to say. But this would actually be because Java likes sign values, negative two billion to positive two billion, basically, okay? That's not exact, of course, right? Because it has all these numbers, but I'm rounding it, right? So you get the point, hopefully, you're finding the actual value, the highest number that can fit inside of this uh, amount of memory. And then if you want to find the actual value for an integer primitive type, you would just plug this in half, okay? So after that, we have a long, which is another very big um, data type, which is eight bytes long. So eight times eight is 64 bits. So two to the power of 64 is equal to 1.84467440 times 10 to the power of 19, which is scientific notation, which is therefore equal to that big number right here these two big numbers if you split in half okay that's the sign value for long all right so hopefully i'm not losing you here but that's just basic uh some practice for us if we want to learn a little bit about you know how these bytes and the bits work okay but you just basically have to understand in the long run that streams use bytes okay and how bytes work more simply all right so anyway let's skip to this why is this important i just told you 
So any data that we grab from a stream will be a signed or unsigned byte. For example, if we read one byte of data from a file and we get the unsigned byte 0 through 255, then we can use that value to figure out what letter or character this corresponds to, okay? So how do we use bytes to represent characters might be your next question after I just read this, right? Because like I said a second ago, if I just recap what I said here, every number that we, or every byte that we can read from a file stream, for example, is going to correspond to a character, like a letter or something like that, okay? So how do we know how to translate bytes, the number here, into an actual character, okay? So we have these things called character sets. The most common one, the most popular one at least, is called the ASCII table, which is a seven bit character set. So two to the power of seven, because seven bits, is one or zero through 127, okay? So that means you, exact, you have exactly 127 different characters here, okay? So this was a table created by some internet community or something like that, like it's the standard for uh, mapping characters within um, computers basically, okay? Or it was the original standard, one of them at least. So anyway, the basic rundown of this is, if you don't know, it's basically gonna have a separate number for every single character um, every single like regular character that is on here, okay? So we even have some special ones like tab and other, and other stuff you would find on the keyboard basically, okay? So anything you could find on a modern American keyboard will, will be found right here, okay? So that's 0 through 127. So let's think about this. What if we want to have other characters on our program, right? What if we want to fit other characters that are not on the ASCII table? Like for example, Chinese characters because they're Chinese keyboards obviously, um, I guess. Um, and then we have English characters. Sometimes English keyboards have um, like special characters, I believe. And then you have Japanese keyboard. I don't know, all kinds of languages, right? So how do we fit all of the characters from other languages onto one character set here, right? We would need more numbers that, than we have here. This is only seven bits, so it can only fit 127 characters, right? So we need a larger bit character set, okay? So before we move on to the Chinese characters and all those thousands of characters, we have the eight bit character set, which is called Latin one which is going to fit 2 to the power of 8, which is 256, right? So that's going to fit, let's open this up here. So that's going to fit 0 through 255, 0 counts as 1. It's like 0 base basically, okay? So anyway, we have many more characters than we can normally fit within ASCII table. It's called Latin 1 because it includes much more of the Latin characters that you would see in like other languages and stuff like that because Latin is a basically a root for other languages, right? Um, hopefully that makes sense. But um, yeah, we're just fitting more characters, right? Because we have more space this time, right? Eight bits instead of seven bits. So we have more space to fit more characters. So what if we need more characters, right? Because we still cannot fit the Chinese language. The, the Chinese languages, our Chinese language has about 80,000 characters, right? So we would need an insane amount of bits. And that's when we move on to Unicode. And Unicode is a 32-bit character set, which is about, I believe if I remember correctly, four million characters that you can fit within, within that uh, character set, okay? So currently in the world, we, only, we don't even have 4 billion characters or a million characters that we can fit. So we have about a million on the Unicode, Unicode table currently, I believe. I'm not, I might be wrong. But yeah, we have a bunch of them on here. We can just keep scrolling for days, really. And you'll find a character for any language. I just found a freaking swastika, right? So um, yeah, you can find any character that you would ever see within a book, all right? That's pretty much how detailed it is because it can fit so many uh, different characters, right? So that's pretty cool. Hopefully you like that. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much the standard. It is the standard for any communication for characters nowadays, okay? So you might see the term UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32. Those are different ways to communicate Unicode letters or characters, and we can get to that later. Don't worry. Because it's going to be a little more difficult because bytes are only 8-bit, right? If you remember correctly, bytes are only 8 bits, so we cannot fit any of these larger characters in here because these are going to be up to 32 bits in size basically uh, it's a little hard to explain but yeah we'll get to that don't worry we'll get plenty of practice but yeah pretty cool right so yeah we have a big giant table that we can use called unicode and it's a big it's a big standard nowadays okay for uh whatever programming and stuff like that right so that's pretty cool and so now we have readers and writers so i'm going to give you a brief overview of what this is because we're going to get plenty of experience with this also um, readers will convert bytes from the underlying stream into characters and then writers will convert characters back into bytes and then put those values into the underlying stream. So what the hell does that even mean, right? As I said before, streams are gonna communicate within, or with bytes, right? That's the unit of data for streams, right? So us humans are not good at reading bytes. You know, like we can't just look at a number and say, oh, okay, that's what that means, dur, dur, dur. 
We have a special classes here called readers and writers, which are automatically going to convert bytes to characters for us so that we can read it. It's going to automatically convert for us so that we can read it without having to translate it ourselves basically in the code, right? So it makes our life easier basically is what I'm trying to say. So readers will read the data from the stream and then show you the characters. And then writers are going to take the characters that you give to it and then convert it to bytes and then put those bytes into the stream like it would normally do. So it's automatically translating characters for you basically, okay? So we're getting plenty of experience with that. And yeah, so finally, we have IO exceptions, okay? And you might have seen this before whenever you're playing around with Java, but an IO exception is basically, of course, a exception that occurs from some IO exception, <laughs> input and output exception, right? So there's different, so there's a top level IO exception class here, but then you have other exceptions under that. You have like file not found exception. So for example, when we start working with file streams, um, it, might not, it might not be able to locate the stream that, or the file that we're trying to connect the stream to, right? So it's gonna throw a file not stream exception, or file not found exception, sorry. Um, and then you have other uh, exceptions under that, which all fall into the category of IO exception, right? So like before we saw that there's different stream classes on the top level, there's also the top level IO exception class, and then under that you have subclasses of that exception, okay? So yeah, just keep that in mind. So we're gonna be working with that, of course, just something for you to keep in mind, okay? And one thing actually I want to show you before we go is the book recommendation for this series, if you're interested. Um, I personally like reading um, or learning new things for programming with books because they're more detailed rather than videos. Of course, my videos are more detailed, you know, because I'm awesome, right? But um, yeah, that's the reason I made videos, by the way, is because I'm used to watching. When I was little, I used to watch videos, programming videos all the time, but I wouldn't learn enough because they're not very detailed. They're focused on creating a, a quick video rather than a detailed video. So that's why I started this channel for you guys to get detailed information so I can do all the heavy research and then you can just watch the video, okay? So anyway, now that I've been rambling, this is a good book that I recommend for you. I'm currently using this for the series. It's basically the template I'm using for this series. I'm not copying it, of course, but I'm using it very heavily. So I recommend you buy this from Amazon or find your find the book in the local library. For example, I found this book in my university library. So yeah, hopefully you find it interesting. If you want to get that book, you can, all right? And that's it for this episode. It's just a quick introduction to Java IO uh, input and output. And um, I'll leave those slides for this um, episode in the description below so you can check it out and bookmark it in case you want to find this link and other stuff like that I left for you. So yeah, that's it. If you have any questions about the series, you can join our Discord server and ask questions there. Or if you're really lazy, you can ask in the comment section below, okay? And finally, if you want to support this channel, if you want to help me grow, help me um, help other people learn, you can support this channel by becoming a member by clicking the join button below this video. And you can join this channel for $0.99, cents, $5, or $10 per month, and you can cancel any time. It's just basically a Twitch donation in a way, but it's for YouTube, okay? So anyway, if you're interested in that, you can do that below this video. Like I said, just click the join button, and that's it. So yeah, if you like this video, leave a like if you want to see more. Subscribe, and peace.